Good evening, everyone. We're very happy that you choose this, our session. It's last session of last day, but thank you for coming. So our topic is using CFCR to manage a Kubernetes cluster. If you come here for using Kubo to manage Kubernetes clusters, don't freak out. Project has been renamed this September after we submit talk, so now the new name is Cloud Foundry Container Runtime. And a little bit about me. My name is Alexander Slinko. I work at Pivotal. Uh, I work on this project since it started. So last year in December, we started it and we named it Kubo that time. And then this September, project got renamed and it got split to open source only part, Cloud Foundry Container Runtime, and commercial part, Pivotal Container Service, which I'm working right now. Hi, I'm Brendan Nolan. I'm a principal software engineer at Pivotal. Uh, I joined Pivotal about six months ago and started working on the Kubo project. Uh, and I've currently transferred with Alexandra onto the PKS team. So here's our agenda for today. Um, the demo is quite involved and a lot, so I'm just going to get straight into it. So for those of you who don't know what CFCR is, it's the Cloud Foundry Container Runtime. Uh, it's an open source software project, which is part of Cloud Foundry and allows the deployment of vanilla Kubernetes clusters using Bosch. Um, the major, the initial founders of the project were Pivotal, Google, and VMware, and we've since been joined with a dedicated developer from Swisscom, but it is an open source project, and we are looking for contributors, people to commit issues, and PRs. So some of you may be familiar with the Cloud Foundry application runtime, um, and I think initially when Within Pivotal and within Cloud Foundry, people started to talk about supporting containers. There was a decision, well, is this the end of the application runtime? And it's not. The application runtime, we don't see it as a, an or, it's an and situation. So application runtime and container runtime still fit together. So we have a lot of Cloud Foundry customers who've been using the application runtime to deploy cloud native applications. But it's a very highly opinionated framework. They're very happy working within that framework. But it's not suited for all types of workloads. Uh, you have a lot of legacy applications that people don't want to port to new code. Uh, and then you have third-party applications that are delivered by containers, and you want to be able to run them within your environment. You have applications that have very complex networking or persistence requirements, and they don't fit within the highly opinionated framework of the application runtime. Why Kubernetes? So for the types of workloads that we're looking at, Kubernetes is the obvious choice. It's the de facto container orchestration engine. And then why part of Cloud Foundry? So we have customers that love the Cloud Foundry operator experience. They're very happy with how they can manage their uh, Elastic Runtime application runtime instances within Cloud Foundry. And they want the same experience operating Cloud Foundry app or container runtime for Kubernetes. So they want a simple way to deploy, simple way to upgrade, a simple way to apply security patches, and a simple way to maintain the health of their VM infrastructure. So the problems we're trying to solve with CFCR. So I think we've all seen that the installation of Kubernetes has become pretty straightforward. We saw Kelsey the other day create a cluster from this phone. Uh, but day two is not so easy, particularly if you're managing your own Kubernetes clusters. That How do you upgrade those clusters? How do you deal with CVs on the underlying operating system? Uh, and while Kubernetes keeps your applications up and running, what keeps Kubernetes running? What's monitoring the VMs that your masters, nodes, and etcd is running on? And High availability doesn't come out of the box still with Kubernetes. It's left up to yourself, and there's a lot of patterns. So as I said, we are powered by Bosch. So Bosch is a Cloud Foundry project. It's quite a mature project. I think it's been around for five years. Uh, it's based on the Google Borg idea of something that manages infrastructure. So we got Borg, Kubernetes together. They want to be mates. And that's where we get the Cloud Foundry container runtime. So. As I said, Bosch is a tool for release engineering, deployment, lifecycle management, and monitoring of these distributed systems. So teams can create their own software releases that are deployable in a very repeatable fashion. And the operators can deploy these software releases very consistently in a reproducible manner. They can do so very, very quickly. Uh, via the CPI, the Cloud Provider Interface in Bosch, it has multi-IaaS support. For CFCR, we have support at the moment for four IaaS, is GCP, AWS, uh, OpenStack and vSphere. And then it uses this OS SAML infrastructure, which is a very base level operating system, which Alex will talk a little bit more later on, which helps to standardize the deployments across all of these uh, uh, cloud platforms. So operation teams find they're incredibly efficient when they're using Bosch. 
So for CFCOR, CFCOR is actually just a Bosch release of Kubernetes. So it's made up of three particular component parts, an etcd release, the standard Docker release, which is already part of Cloud Foundry, an open source Docker Bosch release, and then the Kubernetes Bosch release, Kubo release. Um, each release is for a specific version of Kubernetes. The CFCOR plan to keep up to date with each of the Kubernetes releases. We're currently on 184. It plans to track the Kubernetes version in use by GKE. One of the ideas when Google came on board was that they wanted something where people could run containers in a platform that was very, very similar to what was running in GKE. It has high availability in VM healing through Bosch and easy scaling of the VMs. And there's a very defined release upgrade pattern from Bosch. So we're going to jump into the demo now. Um, and what I had intended to show was um, an initial installation. But as I said, initial installation is very easy. So I've actually pre-installed a Bosch deployment here. And I'll run through how I actually did that Bosch deployment. As you can see, it took about nine minutes to do. So we thought it might be kind of a little bit of a waste of time for the demo. Um, so um, it's a bit awkward. So this is using the Bosch CLI, where we're deploying a deployment called KubeCon. Uh, we're using an initial.yaml, which is a deployment manifest which describes the Kubernetes cluster we want to deploy. In our particular instance, this Kubernetes cluster is a single etcd node, two master nodes, and three worker nodes. It also takes a variable, which is the Kubernetes master host, which is a value that is just put on the SSL certificate that is serving the API server on both the master nodes. Bosch will try to deploy this. Uh, since there's actually no change in the deployment, it'll just say, oh, everything is the same. Your VM infrastructure looks like the deployment as it already is. So just take a second. Now I have a script here where when I created the cluster, we use an internal thing within Bosch called Credit, which again, I'll talk a little bit about more later on, to store the SSL certificate, the credentials, and this is just a script that extracts those bad out and uses kubectl, kubectl config to set them. So we set our Kubernetes configuration. We see we've got our cluster here. So I've just split the screen here at the top. Um, we've got a Kubernetes cluster. And then at the bottom, we just have something that's showing the version and the node. So three nodes, as I said. Uh, and I'm going to attempt now. Oops, no. Oh, oops, oops. gee, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, can you just grab that for a second? <laughs> for some reason, it's hard to type it's this hard one hand. Type one hand yeah. So I'm just going to deploy an application here. Thank you. So um, here's a simple Nginx application in Kubernetes. We're going to deploy this. So we're going to kubectl apply. Uh, we're going to hope it rolls out, depending yeah. on the network now. Please it stop. may not roll out. Yeah. Stop all Wi-Fi. Um, but while that's rolling out, I'm going to start uh, an upgrade of the version of Kubernetes. So a new version of Kubernetes come out. Uh, in this particular reason, I'm going to upgrade to 1.8.2. So. Uh, and I'm so here's the operation file. So an operation file is just a patch uh, mechanism that Bosch uses to patch a particular deployment manifest. You could go in and just edit the manifest, but I'm just showing this operation file for this particular reason, it's easier. Don't have to type and go into VI. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the Kubo version, and I'm changing the Kubo version from 0.8.0, .0, which was the release that had Kubernetes 1.8.1, to Kubo 0.8.1, which is the release that has Kubernetes 1.8.2. I'm running the same deploy command we had earlier on, where I'm targeting the same deployment, the same initial deployment YAML, but I have an operations file, which is my upgrade operations file. Bosch will now tell me that the difference between my uh, manifests, or what's going to happen, is that you're going to upgrade the Kubo version from 0.8.0 .0 to 0.8.1. So I'm going to start that off. And if the demo gods are with us, we're going to see that the timeout did fail, but maybe in the background it's actually. So it's container creating still. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this command, which won't start at the moment. But in a few seconds after it's download, the Nginx container should start. And what that's going to do is it's going to pull the uh, Nginx server every five seconds and just print out the HTTP status and the date. Alex is going to take over now and show the um, capacity, how we scale a cluster. So he's a cluster in GCP. 
what we'll look for when we come back here is that the server version will upgrade to 1.8.2 and the node versions will start to roll to 1.8.2 as well. Yes, so let's see. I now on GCP on Bastion box and let's see what do I have. I have two deployments. So one I call production Kubo and one is staging, Kubo staging. So one production runs with four workers, staging with three workers, and this is fine. And let's see what happens. So I have Kube CTL like running, checking something, and actually I get one bonus demo for you because I will also delete a node on staging. So I choose this node, like, okay, gcloud delete, but gcloud, GCP deletes VMs for three minutes, so it, it will start deleting. And also I want to scale production because why not, everyone wants to. I anticipate huge load. I won't show any applications because like, it runs applications, it's Kubernetes job, it's not our job, but it's from four to, I know, 10. 10, and then I do Bosch, this deployment named Kubo, deploy production. And you see similar output that Brian showed, but I scale working instances from four, so to 10. I say, yeah, scale. And we'll be able to see it. I will think how to show the cube CTL with no sprout later, and for now, it will just run. So let's go back to Brenda's notes so I can see that application is running, and you can see it's getting every second, it's getting new request. HTTP OK, everything is fine. Master is updating. And while master is updating, I will talk a little bit more about Bosch and all primitives that parts of the Bosch. So one thing that Bosch is based on Borg, the same as Kubernetes is based on Borg. And they two very close system, but Kubernetes manages containers, Bosch manages VMs. So, and they have similar primitives and some names are the same. So like Kubernetes has deployments, Bosch has deployments, but trying not containers, it's trying VMs. And so it's running system, the same as in Kubernetes. Deployment is running system with, but here it's VMBSD, some network configuration, some releases that's that running on top of it, and some process running on top of VMs. And it's all monitored by Bosch. So Bosch checks if it's running. If it's not running, it will try to restart. If it's not restarting, it will try to restart VM. And does its magic. And while I was talking, I could see that master got upgraded to 1A2, yay. <sighs> and deployment is defined by deployment manifest that we saw. It's declarative, the same as in Kubernetes, it's declarative. You have to speci you specify what you want to achieve. I want to achieve 10 nodes and in my production cluster and some specific versions. It also has some VM layout, but it's a cloud agnostic, so you don't have to say, for example, in AWS it has a variability zone, and it's all principles across every IS, it's, and bare metal as well. So you just say some Bosch primitives, network, availability zone, and it will do everything for you. And it runs version packages called releases, and it runs on top of base uh, images called stem cells, and some parameters that you can configure how the series will run. For example, after authorization mode for Kubernetes, R back or A back. And let's talk about releases. So releases, it's version software, version uh, packages, which contain software, software binaries, and everything actually, every binary is required to start cluster. And it's not only software binaries, but also Docker releases, for example, for Kubernetes, like kubedns, and software packages like Kubernetes itself. Then definition of properties for a, all these jobs, and then it's self-contained, so at any point you can download this big tarball and upload to any cloud, and if it doesn't have access, if it doesn't have access to internet, it will still run correctly, because it all ha has everything with it. And one more important thing is that you can actually rebuild it at any time. It has some definitions and all those uh, software packages, blobs are uploaded to the S3 or GCS, and you can rebuild at any time and reproduce this deployment. And while I was talking, no starting to be updated and scheduling disabled, 
node got cordoned. So now it's starting. It started 182. One node is 182, and other nodes are getting updated. And let's, let's take a quick look here. So we see that this VM died. Work is starting, and I will try to close this and see if it's going. To... <sighs> okay. I will focus later on the kubectl context port. It will start VMs. And one more thing that I forgot to mention that, as you can see on production, I run 182, and here I run 184 on staging. And it's important because everything self contains, so you can run multiple versions with Bosch. No problems. It's Bosch ha keeps all the software packages. So if it has the system running and you scale it, it will use existing uh, packages that you already uploaded. Let's go back to this. Come on. Okay. Still running, still running. And jobs are part of the uh, release. It describes single running service like Kubelet or Kubernetes API or Docker. And it has some lifecycle scripts like pre start script and start stop script, obviously. But Bosch expects that you can just kill minus nine any service and it will restart it. And drain scripts. So, for example, like for Kubelet is cordon and drain. Also, it's monitors using uh, Monit. So by most, most of the releases just use PID files, but you can use something more complicated with Monit. And it has some configuration, again, defined by properties, so like kubeconfig, you know, something else. And stem cell. So releases are, this, you use stem release to upload to any cloud or bare metal. And stem cell, uh, the images are different by the cloud, but important that they versioned, and each version has the same software on each cloud. So, for example, you have stem cell 3, 4, 4, 5, and it has the same software, like base software core on each cloud. And Bosch team manages it, and in case of CVE, they release updated version in 48 hours, in up to 48 hours, which is they release it quicker. So, you got this new stem cell update immediately. And this leads to same manifest. As I said, manifest can be the same for each cloud, except some cloud-specific things like cloud provider for Kubernetes. But for other releases, it can be the same. And CredHub, which Brandon mentioned, so you need to stock some credentials. And some credentials you don't even care, some passwords are like, they generate it and for its CD password. You, you don't care what is password for its CD. You just care that it's there. Or what are the certificates for Kubernetes, uh, for, for kubectl. You don't care what is it. And what is the certificate for Kubernetes API. You care about CI cert, but not about certificates. So CredHub manages all of it. It generates credentials for each new deployment. So you deploy new deployment, it will generate credentials. If you update deployment, it has the same credentials, which are defined in manifest. You can set credentials manually. And not only credentials, you can store everything. It's config storage. And you can easily rotate credentials. So you, for example, regenerate a certificate, and it will restart Kubelet certificate. It will restart only Kubelet and not uh, master, because master doesn't care about certificate. It cares about CA. And one more thing that. It's actually provided by a common interface called Bosch. I don't know exact name, but it's Bosch Config Server. And it's possible to use your own implementation of this config server. So someone uses Vault, but CredHub solves our things perfectly. And updating is still going. I see that it's scheduled and disabled. Will we wait for one minute? OK. And yeah, maybe I'll check quickly my GCP. <gasps> oh, no. But, yeah, yeah, something went wrong. But the, more impo the important part is that you can always restart it and the system's still running. It's some problem with scripts. I, some timeout, come on. So maybe GC, GC I, quota. Yes, quota. I forgot about quotas. Shouldn't have scaled that much. So, sorry. Sorry, but let's see. It's class is still running, and yeah, it still runs. 
was able to run nine, but not 10. Ah, what a mistake. Sad, sad, but I mean, in real life you can, so as I said, you can proceed with it, maybe delete some instances, request quotas, run in different uh, zone, like multiple ways. Yeah, demo gods, demo gods, I forgot to mention them. That was my mistake. Okay, let's proceed. So, vision for cloud foundry container runtime. We focused on making operators happy. Kubernetes makes developers happy. They can develop their workloads and no problems with it, but operators, they have some problems and we want to, to make them happy. That they want to, they don't need to think too much about day two. It's, Bosch will manage it and it will be very simple. And it's simple. And we wanted to, to keep developers happy, we wanted vanilla Kubernetes, so one way was like maintain compatibility with GKE. So if it can run on CFCR, it should be able to run on GKE, unless you don't have load balances on your IS, and, or maybe like change volume type, but in general it should work. And then when it, conformance was announced, we passed conformance test, we win found one bug in conformance testing, there was some issue. It has been fixed since then. And team right now are working on re 10 It's not 1.0, they're still having some issues and some automation, and this is it's going to be released today or maybe next week. I don't know exactly. So they worked on service catalog integration, and the important part was that they need to configure, something was missing in Kubernetes configuration maybe, and they just run in pipeline. So in pipeline, we deploy during each startup of the cluster, we deploy service catalog and see that everything deploys successfully. Then guarantees release upgrades, again, add this to pipeline. So we can upgrade from 0 0.9 to 0 0.10, no problems, it's tested in pipeline. And test redirection in pipeline as well. Bosch does it for you, but does it for everyone, but we want to test it and see that it's every commit passes and we hand broke resurrection in like misconfigured cluster. Should we come back to? Go back maybe to. Hey, deploy it. So uh, we can see our upgrade of Kubernetes is completed here. Application has continued running. Uh, we're now at version 1.8.2. Um, so we're going to do a very, very similar process. Um, and we'll probably come up. Flash. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, where we're going to upgrade the stem cell this time. So as Alexander mentioned, the stem cell is a kind of a base OS image. Uh, we have a 48-hour turnaround agreement, um, generally managed by Pivotal, where any CV will be patched within that 48-hour period. So our stem cell, we have an operations file here again, which again is just changing the version number of the um, stem cell. I've got the same upgrade operations file, and I'm going to apply both of these to the initial deployment YAML. So normally what would happen is when you make a change to a deployment, you'll save that old deployment locally. But just for the demo purposes here and for scripting purposes, I'm just applying the same operation files again and again and again. But when we look at what happens in the deployment, the only change between this deployment now is that the stem cell version has been upgraded. Now, that's going to go and roll all the bits of the components of the system with that new version of the OS image. There's nothing to really see in terms of the actual demonstration here, but it's just to show that that's the functionality you get. Yeah, it will shut down Node, then start Node again with new OS image. <coughs> okay, let's go back to the future. So what CFCR focuses after 010, they focus on security, availability, so multi-AZ, I know that some customers run in multi-AZ setup, but the thing is that we want to run it in pipeline again. We want to test it to verify it. It works fine, and all the affinity and affinity rules work, so we want to test it. And then define process about 48 hours CVE patches. So if some CVE happens in Kubernetes, in Docker, in etcd, we can patch it and update it, and maybe how we can automate, and then define process about one week Kubernetes upgrade. So I can process, maybe partial automate. We'll see. And now commercial part. So if you we want to pay our bills, so commercial part. And I have stickers with this. So Piotr Container Service. When you're doing a 
like in big organization, often small, you don't have one cluster, you have multiple clusters. And managing them using YAML, it's not interesting. Like, no one wants to be enterprise YAML developer. So we create PKS so you can manage multiple clusters. It gives on-demand provisioning, so we can provision new cluster with simple CLI command and it just starts cluster and you can upgrade and do all the same that CFCR can do because it runs on top of open source Kubernetes package in open source CFCR. And it's multi-cloud. For now, we support GCP and vSphere. And it's enterprise race as multiple VMware integrations like NSXT, Harbor, VROPS, Wavefront, and more, which didn't fit in one slide. I should have split like multiple slides. Uh, and everything is still managed by Bosch. So no additional things. It still manages CFCR managed by Bosch and control access to control bet access. I don't know how it's and it will be available mid-December, so it was announced on Spring 1 this week. So it will be available starting 15th of uh, December. Ask VMware folks who are here or contact Pivotal if you want to have access. And these are links, so documentation, code with uh, CFCR, it's called, still called Kubo, we haven't renamed it. We know what should be the correct name for CF. And then I used Kubo deployment to deploy my cluster on GCP, I just modified it a little bit to change uh, amount of instances. Then Slack, team is team using this Slack, open source Slack, and demo for this starts cluster on VirtualBox, so you can start and see how it's working. And yeah, by the way, it's still upgrading because it needs to shut down VM start container even if it's inside the virtual box and our CI it's green it's green I mean it's always green but yeah. so this is just something very important in terms of what Alexander was mentioning mentioning about particular things that are coming in the future so particularly security operation alerts or multi AZ yeah. that unless we have this in a pipeline where it's fully automated and tested for every single release we don't guarantee or don't say it's supported so while people are running multi AZ it's not in the pipeline yet, so that's why so we're not saying that it's yeah. there. We have GCP, vSphere, AWS, and OpenStack. Some custom configurations for... Oh, no. Okay, no one saw that. <laughs> yeah, demagods. I demagods, forgot to yeah. set yeah. those demagods. Okay, that's it. We open for your questions, and we leave in tomorrow, so we will hang out after this talk. Yes, see the question. Okay, question about, you can, uh, Diego, for people who don't know, it's container runtime that manages Cloud Foundry application runtime. Cloud Foundry application runtime can run together with Cloud Foundry container runtime, but it's not required, so it's Diego still stays in application runtime. Can, uh, container runtime runs Kubernetes, and it can run separately, it can run together and reuse some features from Cloud Foundry application. So, no, so... Um, Not exactly. Container runtime is completely independent. For the initial release of container runtime, we're operating a bring your own load balancer. So, initially, internally within the clusters, we were deploying HA proxy load balancing. In the demo that I've shown here, I'm running a HA proxy load balancer on my local machine, and we're routing, and then in GCP or vSphere, particularly with the latest version of NSXT, there'll be load balancer support there as well. So. Um, well, you can if you are running Cloud Foundry or Pivotal, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. You can use the TCP router or the Go router, but it's not a requirement, and yeah. there's no interdependencies. Yeah. There's so, just additional hooks that allow you to use it if you yeah. want to use it. If you want to use it, you can use it. You don't have to use it. Yes? Is uh, NS NSXT a recommended uh, add-on for uh, container runtime, or is that? It's a separate add-on, and it's so right now it's only for PKS. And you, I'm not sure, maybe you can get it somehow for, 
I use this Cloud Foundry container runtime, but right now it's only. So yeah. NSXT is a commercial product yeah, from commercial. VMware. The VMware folks might be able to give some more information about it. You could run it using you container runtime. Could run you it. could integrate it yourself. Yeah. Uh, the default is Flannel. Um, Flannel is a very open, flat network for containers. NSXT has a lot more enterprise-y type features around security, firewalling, and controlling that network of your containers internally. So that's where there's yeah. a lot of value add for the enterprise yeah. with NSXT. Yeah. And the NSXT integration part is not open source, I think. I don't know, but I think yes. Yes? Yes, VM images, so it's it. So stem cells are built by, in general you want to use stem cells built by Bosch team, and for Amazon they use AMIs, for GCP they use Google images, for Azure, Azure images, I don't know how they're called, for uh, vSphere, like big tarballs, I forgot, and for OpenStack, again, big tarballs. So they, they build it. If you really want, you can build your own stem cell, but like, if you really, really want, I don't know. I don't want to manage it and keep against CVs. So. What OS is this? Uh, Ubuntu and CentOS are supported by Bosch team. Then SUSE supports SUSE stem cell and Windows stem cell. Also, we have Windows stem cell, but we don't have Kubernetes for Windows yet because it's not like, I think it's in beta Kubernetes on Windows. Yes? Okay, so that's good. That's a good question. So let's. I, I will show my manifest. So I will show my manifest. So production, and I have this AZs in YAML, which is for now it's Z1. But I can do if I if I would be really sure I would use Z2, Z3, Z4, and it's all defined in specific configurations that called cloud config. So I will show cloud config. I hope it doesn't have any secrets. It, uh, it has my source account. Oh no. So we have this types of VM. So it's like N1 standard. And I have AZ, which is AZ. It's US West 1. So I can have US West 1B, it will be Z2. And for example, for Amazon, it will be different. For VMware, it will be different. And it's still called Z1 in my manifest, but in Cloud Config it will be different. So, does that answer your question? So usually you just specify the AZs in the manifest that you say, specify, okay, I deploy it on multiple AZs and I don't care how they separate against, say like, Bosch does it for me, I, I don't care. It separates them. I can check, okay, can I deploy here? Usually it separates them evenly, but if it can deploy in some AZ, like limits are, uh, there are limits, so it's, it will deploy in different AZ, more nodes. Does this answer the question? Okay, good. Any more? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. We have stickers, and we'll hang around for some time.